I believe that young people have so much untapped potential, capacity, and energy. And one of the main reasons that this abundance of resource is not being fully utilized is because people oftentimes perceive younger people as less credible. But just because young people are developing biologically and are sometimes dependent on others for their political, social, and economic well-being does not mean that they don't have hands and feet to mobilize and take actions or that their thoughts, ideas, and emotions are less valid than an adult. I think with the provision of tools of empowerment, a platform to share their ideas, and somebody who doesn't belittle them or their endeavors, that they can make change in the world. And there's evidence of this out there, from the Ashoka youth to friends I know who are empowering other youth. Global health, the clues in the name, is global. It needs the participation of everyone to make any real difference. No one must be left out of the conversation. Global Citizen is a community that has managed to engage and call to action people around the world to change things for the better. This includes a very important demographic whose voices are sometimes not heard, but have a lot to say. That's young people, otherwise known as Gen Zers. Their fellowship program, in partnership with the Be Good Foundation, has managed to create an environment where young people are given skills to be leaders. We know from our previous discussions on mentoring that mentees really need to be in the driving seat and giving them the reins prepares them for the world. As researchers in global health, how can we learn from and use this model to be better mentors and mentees and to create future leaders and scientists that are more engaged with the world around them? This and more in our episode today. Welcome to your digital mentor. I'm your host, Dr. Christine Boynet, coming to you from the Welcome Sang Institute, but truly coming from home. Um, in today's episode, we'll be discussing how we can engage and empower our young people, right? And how giving them a voice can bring fresh ideas, but also be invaluable in shaping their own career. And joining me are two wonderful guests, a long-term and very dear friend, Chebet Chikumbu. She's a Global Citizens Regional Director for Southern and East Africa. And our second guest is Nogmologi Baba, Marketing Coordinator coordinator for a healthcare platform called epion.net, but also a 2019 Be Good Fellow. Welcome to Bet and Knox. Uh, before we start, I wanted to actually deviate from the subject to the subject of names and kind of understanding each other's cultures because, you know, we're trying to establish a platform that is a digital platform for mentorship and a lot of that encompasses bringing the global world together so that we are one sort of community. And one of those things is understanding each other's culture. And I think in reaching out to Chibet and hearing of you, Knox, there was a discussion of names and, you know, you refer to yourself as Knox and I thought I'm going to try my hardest to refer to your full name. And I know I don't say it as beautifully as your mom would, but uh, we were discussing that, you know, with trying to kind of bring the world together, they sort of, we have to create an environment to understand each other and also try. So for example, I would try with my friends who are French or Spanish or Portuguese and say their names how they would say it. So why shouldn't I try with my African brothers? and sisters. So I was wondering, you know, what are your both experiences in using non-Western names? Maybe we can share a little bit about the sort of the pride and also these names have meanings and it's not just in Africa, but you know, uh, in my time in Asia, there's such beautiful meanings behind our names. And I was wondering whether you can share that with our listeners just to give a bit of background and context to why we have such beautiful names and why we'd want to refer to ourselves with our non-Western names. I'll start with Javette. Thanks, Christine. So as you know, and for your listeners, for the longest time haven't known me as Chibet. You've known me as Lorraine. So I think even that in itself has been an adjustment given the, the tenure of our friendship, which spans over two decades. And for me, I think my aha moment was in reading more and understanding more around the impact of the transition to democracy and how, you know, the bearing that had on my parents and the decisions they made to give me a Christian name, a French name at that, I, for the longest time, I'd say for the first two decades, really owned it. In fact, maybe to a fault, like sometimes I took it to mean that that name had been given to me because when you have an English sounding name, there's more acceptance in the world. And that was kind of the narrative. And as I exposed myself more to African literature and, you know, came to understand the meaning behind names and the power of just stepping into the, the fullness of your name. So Chibet in Kalenjin, which is our shared heritage, Christine, means light. It literally means born at noon. And so for me, that became such an 
important reminder on a daily basis, like step into your light, bring light into every room and just be the light, be that person. Obviously, this is theoretical in some instances because COVID-19 has really brought a lot of darkness into our world and like shifted our realities. But I think even in these times, especially, I'm reminded of what the name means and reminded to seek light in everything that I do. So not to say that I don't appreciate English names. I've just, I think, gained a deeper appreciation for what my native name actually means and why it's important to me to be referred to by it. Oh, that's awesome and, and really beautiful that your name means uh, such a beautiful thing. I mean, I'll add my own personal anecdote. There was early in the year a BBC article that said you should ask people how to say their names. And I think I very rarely go by my, my Kalenjin name, which is Cherop, but it also means born after the rain. So when I was young, I used to think I had some superpower to control the rain, which I still do sometimes, to be honest. So, But I think it's such a beautiful thing to have something so beautiful to refer to. And what about you, Knox? I mean, for my time, and I'll say this in my heritage we don't have the the sort of clicking sound and I had to make my tongue kind of practice it so that it can come it's not quite as beautiful but I wanted you to kind of describe you know what the meaning behind your your beautiful name is my name is Nokolo and it's the only name I have actually. So like I don't have an alternative. It means wheat peas in Zulu and in Kosa. I appreciate the meaning of it because like I believe that I'm a very peaceful person. It actually like reflects on like who I am. In terms of pronunciation, it's a perfect example of a click name actually. When you are not used to like the clicking language and everything, uh, it will be hard for you to say the name. But I appreciate people actually learning how to say it. People actually can alternatively call me Knox, which I don't mind as well. Even people who know how to pronounce my name and even my mom can call me Knox anytime, which I don't mind. So um, I like how it sounds. I like the challenge it gives and I like the meaning behind it. Oh, that's awesome. And, and thank you so much for giving me permission to call you Knox. And sorry if I butchered, butchered the way I said your name. That's no problem. Awesome. And we're really honored to have you both on the podcast. So a bit of background, I've known Chubet since the Nokia 3310 was, was the must-have phone, so you guys can do the math. But I wanted us to, <laughs> to kick it off first. And I've known, obviously, as I said, Chabet for a really long time and following her career. And I'm really honored to kind of have you on the podcast because you're involved in such a great uh, initiative. And I really want the world to know what you're doing. It's to change the world for something better, especially in this dark time. So please just, you know, give us a bit of background about yourself and, and what you do. Sure. Thanks, Christine. I really appreciate you having myself, but also extending this podcast to hearing more about the work that we do at Global Citizen. So uh, my name is Chibet Chikumbu. It's an interesting combination because the first part will tell you that I'm from Kenya originally. The second part will tell you that there is some Southern African in the mix. So I'm married to a Zimbabwean man and we have been living in South Africa for almost two decades now. South Africa Africa really is a big part of my existence. So I often say that I'm Kenyan born, South African bred, because that's truly my identity. And uh, what I really own in terms of my place in the world is I'm a pan African woman who cares about young people. Being a member of the youth myself, I'm very committed to understanding how we can evolve, how we can continually learn, but more so how we then unleash our true potential as young people to achieve much more if we are exposed to the right tools, if our skills are honed in a specific way, if we have access to specific mentors and resources, what we are able to achieve. So for a long time, particularly for people of color, there's almost been a ceiling to how far we can go because we don't necessarily have the networks or we haven't leaned into the networks as much as we can. We haven't harnessed the power of the internet and you know, really tapped into what technology can offer us in terms of connecting us to other people around the world to expand our resource base and to build bigger toolkits to work from. So that's something that I've really thought about in terms of my purpose and what I can do in service to others. And, you know, I'm really grateful that um, we've reconnected after all these years. I mean, I always believe that paths eventually 
come together again and converge. For sure. And in this instance, that we're able to do something that we both care about, which is how do we work with this digital age, but in such a way that we are uplifting young people and upholding legacies that have been, in a way, handed to us to God. I'm very grateful that that's what I'm able to kind of do in a personal capacity. That's what I've assumed as my role and what I'm hoping to achieve as part of my time on earth. In terms of my professional capacity, I'm the regional director for Southern and East Africa at Global Citizen. What this role entails is I lead our regional office that is based in Johannesburg. So we set up about two years ago following an enormous campaign that yielded incredible impact that was celebrating the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela. And it was our inaugural festival on the continent, really. And I'm not sure if you are familiar with our model, but pretty much we're a movement of engaged citizens who are using their collective voice to end extreme poverty by 2030. So we do this through a digital platform which is either our website or our app where global citizens learn about the systemic causes of extreme poverty. They take action on a range of key issues. They earn rewards as part of a global community committed to lasting change. And then we use events as a convening opportunity to bring world leaders to a stage where they're able to make meaningful financial and policy commitments towards key interventions or social impact areas. And you've touched on such a cool thing. I I remember the Mandela 100 and the 2018 concert. That was a massive thing. And when I was like, it really put you guys for me on the map and I was I didn't realize you guys were doing such wonderful things uh, and I'm really I really I'm passionate about um, global health and one of the things I looked up on your website it said such a profound thing is where you live shouldn't decide whether you live and I think for me that was something so powerful and and really matched with what we as scientists and you guys you know as action callers are trying to do because without that without giving people an idea of what's happening in the world they can't really act to change anything because they don't know anything and i've always believed ignorance is not the fact that you don't know anything it's the fact that you don't want to find out moving on that also when you said giving young people the chance to be the gods so we will eventually not be the gods no longer and i've always said and our motto here the podcast is paid for it. Now here's where Knox, we'd want to have you jump in and tell us about you and how you have been a champion and a leader and how your work with Be Good has helped. I'm a digital marketing graduate and I also do events management. I'm very passionate about the arts industry. I became a um, big good fellow. I am still actually involved in an NPO called Africa Fashion Alive, where we uplift different artists from fashion designers to visual artists to showcase their skills because I'm very passionate about people showcasing their skills to do good in the world. I was placed within the marketing department in Global Citizen, whereby I was able to actually showcase what I have and really my passion within an organization that does very big platform. So uh, through that space, I was able to gain skills that would help me like lift my career. And I'm currently a marketing coordinator in a health hub platform called appian.net. And yeah, I'd say from the skills I've gained, I'm able to apply them to what I'm doing right now and seeing what I can apply in terms of like giving back to my community. Thanks so much, Knox. And already I can see even from the leadership in you is emanating as you speak. So I'm really, I'm really dumbfounded. I mean, with young people, even with, let's say, Greta Thunberg, you know, the passion in young people now, they really are the future. And this is what this podcast today or this episode today is about trying to see how you as the young people have become engaged from organizations such as Global Citizen and how having successful mentoring or in fact someone to help you learn how to lead can lead to a very successful career or choosing a successful career and instilling confidence in yourself. So I've been thinking also just a quick question of to you Knox what made you decide to apply for the Global Citizen Be Good Fellowship Program? Actually, when I saw the poster and the requirements and what the fellowship was about, I just saw that like this is for me, uh, this fellowship 
program was made for me. When I applied, I had intentions in terms of like being aware of like what skills I have and what I'd like to benefit from the program and what I'd like to learn going onwards. So, so that motivated me. And they also wanted like young people who are already making a change or would like to make some type of change within their communities. And as I've mentioned, I'm part of um, an NPO called AFA and I was already like making a change and it was a great opportunity for me to learn more on how to impact my community. So it was just a great fit for me. Wow, that's awesome. And Chibet, do you mind telling us a bit more about the program itself? So what's central to Global Citizens' theory of change is the belief that systemic impact is best achieved through policy change. But if we take one step before that, we also recognize that in the context of developing countries and nations, we also know that there's a critical importance of directly investing in the lives of individuals. So the fellowship program really was born out of the idea that we need to think of a meaningful way to invest back into communities in a way that would understand what the skills gaps are, but also beyond that, find a way to equip young people with the skills that they need to thrive in a future working environment. You know, one of the ways that we thought to do that was through the introduction of the fellowship program, which is in partnership with Be Good, which is Beyonce's philanthropic initiative. Also with great financial support from Tyler Perry, this program was then put together as a commitment to support building the skills of young Africans and future generations as part of Global Citizen, Be Good, Beyonce and Tyler Perry's ongoing efforts to achieve a world free from extreme poverty, where we know that one of the direct causes of poverty is not being able to fend for oneself and unemployment really playing a big part within that. If we try and kind of dig deeper into why people are not getting the jobs, on one hand, it is a supply and demand game. But on the other hand, it's that the skills that are on demand are just simply not there and that we're not evolving enough to keep up with those needs as they come in the job market. I think something that has been really, really important for us in shaping this program is thinking about how we build capacity through our young people, how we respond to some alarming statistics like youth aged between eight to 25 years of age are the most vulnerable in the South African labor market. And yet they have faced about more than half of this group are unemployed. So, you know, that vulnerability is really deep by the fact that they are not able to sustain themselves because there's a constant gap that needs to be bridged. So we're hoping to really fill that gap is by undertaking a thorough skills gap analysis and doing what we must in the course of a year. So the fellowship program itself is delivered as a year long paid fellowship. And in that year, as an organization, as an implementing partner, we are here to really make sure that we are investing sufficiently in the skills development and capacity building efforts so that we're then able to launch the young people the young fellows who come through this program into the working world with some level of confidence that they'll be in a position to thrive. What type of skills would you give? Is it types of workshop you'd give them? What are the, the skills you'd give them? Kind of go forward, not only in the fellowship, but beyond that. What kind of the skills would you, would you be instilling in the fellows? Part of the implementation is that we place the fellows in four areas of our operation, whether it's in our content team, which is exposing our fellows to the importance of storytelling and the tactics that one would use in thinking about how to creatively shape narratives around tragedy and triumph and hope and issues around legacy and what that looks like. Um, to campaigns where we are actively mobilizing a network and working with young campaigners to address the UN global goals. So you mentioned global health. For example, we had a fellow last year who was really invested in pursuing that as a career path in pursuing healthcare as a way of, you know, self-actualizing. And so what we did was we, we tried to understand what he knew about what it takes to mobilize young people around a campaign. And beyond that, what are the policy reforms that are needed to really move the dial in global health? 
health. So we exposed him to the stakeholders involved. We exposed him to writing a pitch document. We exposed him to the world of grant making and really just, you know, down to the importance of building lasting relationships. That was something that we, we made sure we did and then play a role in connecting the person to a future healthcare organization. I think with Knox, what was interesting, and this brings me to the third area of our operation is marketing. Under the marketing department, we expose our fellows to understanding how to promote the content, the stories that we're writing, and then the campaigns that we're producing. And then taking it to the next level, how do we maximize the reach of our messaging? And Nokolo was phenomenal and really came in with some of the lived experience in her own NGO space to some of the organizations that she's just mentioned. Did you say AFI, Knox? It's AFA, Africa Fashion Alive. Africa Fashion Alive. So, you know, trying to understand how Knox understood promotion and amplification and maximizing reach there. And then being able to say, well, here's what it takes to promote at scale and to reach a mass audience. And here's how we do it through one of our campaigns. So we were able to really walk Knox on a journey through that internal placement. And then our hope is that as she then transitioned to epion.net, where she's now, being able to then fully apply those marketing skills and obviously lean on the mentorship that she's gained along the way. So that's one of the ways in which we, we, we remain invested in that journey and making sure that we're not only exposing you to just the kind of 101 of what a department does. But beyond that, we're helping you understand the stakeholders involved, the effectiveness of professional communication and etiquette in the work environment, how to get by internally, but then also externally as you speak to other important partners in the process. And that becomes the fullness of what we're offering. And then, you know, ours is then to package that, give it to the fellows, and then hopefully they're able to then take that on. And what we're trying to do, because it's so easy with programs to kind of leave it there. But the Be Good Fellowship program is also invested in that journey beyond. So this is just the first class, but that we are invested in creating that alumni base and staying in touch so that we understand what that employability has been. Have there been any stumbling blocks? And then back to, we mentioned at the beginning, do you have access to the mentors you need to then propel your career forward. So that's something that we're still working up and working on, but it's something that we're very invested in in making sure that we're thinking about that pre, during, and post journey for our fellows. That's super important. I think measuring um, impact in this type of program is going to be probably the, the biggest, one of the biggest things. And you see, it's much, much more about follow on. And we heard yesterday from one of our interviews that, you know, being a mentee or being mentored, it's a full on lifelong career. You just don't stop needing a mentor. And I was going to ask Knox, how did you go into a room? I'm assuming when you were thrown into the marketing department, you went in and there's all sorts of people who have all sorts of accolades to their names. How did you find your voice in a room full of experts? And I only ask this because for me, growing up in a fairly respectful culture, I it took me a really long time to develop that muscle to be able to go into a room and ask questions and not feel silly. And as, as again, as I say, you know, you're the fool for not asking any questions, to be honest. There's no wrong question. So how did you feel going into a room and saying your ideas and having that kind of confidence and building it up. I'm sure it built up over time, but tell me your whole process. Going into the room the first time, I didn't know what to expect actually, but like as um, I was there, it wasn't that hard actually, because I already knew what was being offered. We had like different sessions with like the different uh, departments telling us what do they do actually, what do they have to offer? And if we were being part of shadowing anyone in the department, what we would be doing. In terms of myself, I was able to identify my strengths and what I want from the program and um, what I have to offer. Going into the program, I already knew that I want to be within the marketing department, even after they presented it to me and I was able to speak through my work. I was able to speak through uh, participating um, in different departments that were there by showing off my skills, what I can do, and by also being interested in what I want to learn. 
communicating also uh, with the leads on like what I'm good at and what I'd like to learn was very easy because they gave us a platform to actually be free and communicate and also show off what we're interested in. We were not limited in terms of choosing which department you want to be part of. Even though you are part of one department, you can also reach out and hop on into another department whereby you can like even discover new skills and also amplify on your skills. So I was able to show off what I'm able to do by being involved in the different departments and getting um, different skills from those departments. So what's the one skill that you came out from after the fellow program? What's the one skill? Actually, I'll say two. What are the two biggest skills you came out learning from this? I'd say the two skills that I came out with from uh, the Be Good program that I'm using currently would be content creation. I was able to like create, create content for a platform that reaches a large number of people and being comfortable about creating that type of content. And also branding. I was given an opportunity to take on the branding for a big organization. So right now I'd say I'm very comfortable with like taking on a project that would want me to do both socials and branding. So. Those two schools are very important and I'm still applying them till today. That's cool to hear that you've come out with something tangible. And I think one thing that uh, from both of you, the conversation that we've been talking is this call to action, which is quite phenomenal. And I saw only last month, you you know, Global Citizen was able to raise $3.5 billion to, towards Gavi and the vaccine challenge. Tell me more how you guys are able to engage people to go for such a, I mean, sort of vaccines is, I think it's a very, I mean, controversial in some instances, but as a, in someone in research, it's a no brainer. Uh, but I was wondering, how do you manage to engage so many people, including young people, and then letting them find their voice to be able to um, enact change? I'll throw that to Chebet first. Firstly, it's just so heartwarming to hear all the wonderful takeaways that Knox got from her year on the fellowship program. It's really great that, you know, one can tangibly say, I am able to create content and I was part of the brand building process. For me, I'm just like, that is, that is it. That is what success looks like. And that really feels good. So to your question, Christine, our niche lies in our ability to take the voices of engaged and informed millennials into the halls of political power. And we do that by combining the influence of pop culture particularly through music. We know that music is the single biggest unifier for us, you know, at, at a global level. And we combine that with digital campaigning. And what we know about our millennials, uh, Gen Zers, is that young people of today are really activated. They are really in tune with what it takes to address structural and systemic issues of injustices. We've seen it recently with Black Lives Matter, with so many people being galvanized, predominantly young people really understanding their place in society and tapping into that inner agency. So I think there's something to be said about the awakening at a global level that there is right now, I think, in comparison to perhaps the baby boomer generation, right? Um, there's a lot more trust that has been given to young people in being able to voice their concerns, but also to see the agency within themselves and how that can then be thoughtfully applied to creating real change in society. So the way we've gone about doing that is in terms of our model and how it intersects between pop and policy. On the pop side, we work with artists who in essence are activists as well, really, because they have issues that they care about. And we know that they're speaking to audiences of young people who equally care about those issues. So th those become like connecting points. Then on the policy side, we think about ways to produce content in a digestible way that speaks to young people. We are very in tune with some of the ways in which young people want to be, I don't want to say addressed, but where they're receiving their information, where they're connecting with the world. And a big part of the data shows us that our audience is mobile first. So that's something that we 
really tap into in terms of our delivery of our content and and beyond our content, our campaigns. You know, we we think about where are young people kind of getting their information. So many people are relying on Facebook and Twitter these days as their news source, and that's the supply of information versus the traditional news outlets, right? And we can have a, a big debate about fake news, because I know that's something that circles. But I think the long and short is that social media has really become a big source of people's well of knowledge. And so if that's where people are getting it from, then what we then in turn are applying as part of our content delivery, our content development is putting together digestible information that can then be positioned on those social media channels. So we lean on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other you know social media platforms like that to really communicate the messaging around, we are the generation that can take action that will leave lasting effects for the next generation. We have what it takes to create real change in society. So because we know that our audiences know exactly where to find that information, that's where we would sort of direct it to. That being said, there is something to be said about doing things at scale. And I think that's where we have been motivated most recently in terms of being able to create campaigns and deliver them virtually under the circumstances of COVID-19. So most recent campaign was titled Global Goal Unite, and it was a campaign a concert and a summit calling on citizens to tackle global injustices by using our collective voice to drive change for everyone everywhere. And, you know, with that specifically, we were really calling on world leaders to invest in the vaccines, the therapeutics, the diagnostics, and the treatments that are needed to ensure that everyone everywhere has equitable access. And, you know, that really being a central message for us, but also very much in tune with the vision of the organization, which is we would like to alleviate extreme poverty by 2030. And we cannot do so without the power of young people rallying behind these campaigns and getting their voices heard in those political hallways. So, yeah, that's a bit of the how we go about it and, um, and how we connect from campaign to citizen engagement. Oh, I really like that. And, and I think the spreading it out around young people and who are very, you know, fast as my dad would say dot com about uh social media and knowing how fast you can spread the word is kind of part of for me what has been really powerful i think with covid and educating people and people's attention plans are really short so one quick question and you know as we're wrapping up to our discussion point and this is to both of you i think i found this is a good way to interact with my guests and push them a little bit is if you are you know jane jane someone sitting at home and you're young and you want to have a change in your, maybe it's something local, but it has impact, potential to impact your community. What would the few things you'd say they should kind of do to start tackling and getting the community involved to be able to do something about it? What would you advise uh, young Jane to do? I'd say as young Jane to make a change in my community would be um, to actually advise and encourage the leaders of our community to have young voices and young people who would actually communicate how the life is right now and to communicate what struggles they are going through right now. Because I feel like sometimes the representatives do not align or understand the younger generation or the digital space that's happening right now. So as young Jane, I'd go for integrating younger people into the leadership spaces as well. I really like that. How about you, Chavet? What are your parting words of wisdom to Jane? My parting words to Jane would be that ignorance is not bliss. And we are set up to learn more we have more access to information. We might not have access to the tools that give us that information. That's obviously a, another area of deficit in its own, but the information we need is around us. There's, you know, and we have a right to that information. So knowing that, I think we need to take more ownership, more responsibility to get access to that information. And with the knowledge of the issue areas, 
I think once you've understood what you don't know, you can then use that to activate your inner agency and take action. As a citizen, that's the highest office in any country. You have the power to vote your leaders in, in place. You have the power to speak up and raise your voice. And I would just urge young Jane to learn more about the various issue areas. We use the Sustainable Development Goals as our solution framework. I would urge people to understand what they are, all SDGs, one through to 17, to understand what resonates. And if there's an issue area that you're really compelled to do something about, speak up about it, take action, find out who your community leader is that is championing those initiatives, participate, put your hand up, vote for leaders who will safeguard and champion those initiatives forward. And really, I think, pay it forward. Once you've understood it, um, I love that you said that's a motto of the podcast. That's a motto of Be Good and Beyonce as well um, as part of this fellowship offering is this idea of once you have received, you know, it is on you to then hand that power over to the next person. And I think that's how we, we will ultimately move the needle on these systemic issues that we're grappling with in our society. Really, thank you guys for that. So I'm going to even just summarize it. So to all our listeners, I, I, from what I'm hearing from Chibet and Knox, you, you got to find champions, first of all, and arm yourself with information or knowledge so that, and I think that will then translate into confidence on how you approach community leaders to be able to affect change. So trust yourself and sort of be brave about it. And I think this even goes back to develop that muscle to be brave and know that what you're doing is completely right. And I've always been, liked the saying in Silicon Valley, move fast, break things. I don't like to move fast because of making mistakes, but I like the idea of breaking things and what we call now disruptive technology. And I think why I say this, to have more young people in the organization or even in your thoughts and in research, you are less limited by things that won't work. So I say, you know, throw your ideas at the wall, see what works, and you'll learn with time what doesn't work. But I think sometimes you get a radical change and then a fantastic, fantastic thing happens where it's a combination of imagination and uh, feasibility and you've got uh, gold, you've got a unicorn there. Um, and as now we come back to the end of the episode, we'll take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. But when we come back, we'd love to hear your take home message that you have for our listeners and how they can empower themselves and find their voice. This episode is supported by Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences, a program which develops and delivers training and conferences that span basic research, cutting-edge biomedicine, and application of genomics in healthcare. Through engaging and networking, the events educate, inspire, and transform careers worldwide. This episode is also supported by the Wellcome Sanger Institute. It undertakes large-scale research that forms the foundations of knowledge in biology and medicine. It uses the power of genome sequencing to understand and harness the information in DNA. The Sanger's discoveries are used to improve health and to understand life on Earth. This episode is also supported by social entrepreneurship to spur health. The SESH group uses crowdsourcing to enhance health and health research with a focus on low- and middle-income countries. Welcome back. We've covered a lot of things in discussion, which I'm so, so thankful to hear from Knox and Chibet. I'd love for both of you to be able to summarize one or two points to our listeners, for them to take away from the discussion about finding your voice and being your own captain. It's a very famous poem, if I remember the right poet. It's uh, Mr. William Ernest Henley. I've just checked in Google here, so I have no shame to say it. But it was, I'm the master of my fate. And I'm the captain of my own soul. I love that saying. And you really have to be able to, to direct. And same in mentorship. You have to be able to direct your own career. Know where you're going so that someone else can actually help you. So I was wondering whether you can both share some, some tips that you'd want to let our listeners know. And again, I'll start maybe with Chibet this time. The great American poet Maya Angelou said it best. If you don't like something, change it. And if you can't change it, change your attitude. I am really proud of the fact that I serve an organization that has created a platform where young people can use their voice for change. They can take action. You can take action on our website, on our app. 
globalcitizen.org to really find a way to call on world leaders to step in and make the financial commitments needed to see the change that we need in our societies, whether it's at the community level, constituency, country or continent level. Ultimately, what we're saying is an engaged citizen has the capacity to change things if they take action. So that's what I would just encourage our listeners today is take action. And it starts with a single step of finding organizations that are invested in societal change, finding the community leader within your area that you can call on to be a mentor, being a mentor in turn to others who are looking up for some leadership in that regard. Because I always think that that's something, that's a challenge that we should all take on. And it really just requires learning more about the issue, being committed to seeing the change and being the change that you want to see in the world. So that is what I would encourage you all. Let's take action together and build lasting change. Oh, I love it. And how about you, Knox? What are your words of wisdom to young people wanting to do something? I believe that everyone has some sort of skill, some sort of gift. And I feel that like as a person, you should be aware of what you have to offer, what your gift is or what your purpose is. That uh, you should be present, present in every moment. Uh, therefore, you'll be aware of what you have to offer to your environment or to the world and what the world has to offer for you. That way you'll be able to identify what's missing or what you can improve. And lastly, I'd say do the best you can with whatever you take out. Just make sure that you do your best take it out there and everything else will follow if you are putting your best forward i guess like opportunities will follow and people will listen and people will be interested on what you have to offer no thank you so much and i think with that is just to kind of finalize a parting gift so summarizing the knowledge that you know, as young people, you need to arm yourself with knowledge. And another thing that I say to myself is, you know what you know, for what you don't know, you can find out. So you, it's up to you as the person to find it out yourself. And if you're working with young people, I've always said, you have to give them the chance to have these ideas, give them the room to be able to have ideas and don't like knock somebody down for having any idea. Cause again, the only silly idea is the one you, you don't see through. So and with that, I just kind of thank you both for joining us and coming on the podcast. Would you be able to share with our listeners where they can find you on social? Um, if Chibet, you go first. Absolutely. To our listeners, each one of you can take action to make the world a better place and end extreme poverty through our website, globalcitizen.org, or you can follow us on Twitter, Global Citizen Africa. That's at Global Citizen Africa. Thank you so much, Abed. Um, Knox, would you share with our listeners where they can find you? You can find me on Twitter. My handle is unique underscore Noxy, unique with an Y-O-U underscore Noxy. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Please follow us on Twitter at mental underscore podcast. That's mental underscore podcast. We will let you know when the new episodes are released. You can also listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud by searching.